difficult and when there's a temptation to not obey God, to, what, what is it that stirs you to choose faith over sin? <clears throat> You know, we, we see in, a, in, a, in the world, there's a lot of different uh, factors, there's a lot of different motivations that uh, lead to success in our world, right? Like people, they go into jobs, they go into these big businesses, they make a lot of money because usually they're, they're motivated by money, power, things like that. Um, if you've seen the, the show uh, Shark Tank, you may be familiar with uh, Barbara Corcoran. I'm not 100% sure how to say that last name. Um, But when it came to her starting her own business and becoming an entrepreneur, she said, I had 22 jobs before I started my own business at the age of 23. And I didn't want one more boss telling me what to do. So I was motivated simply because I didn't want a boss. Cool. Um, So I I wish that I I would respond that way uh, in in different ways, right? Um, But when it comes to motivation, we, we can see that, that motivation matters in, in a lot of sin, in, in a lot of cases. And over the last two chapters that we've been in, in Daniel, we have seen motivations to stay faithful to, to the Lord. Um, if you remember chapters 10 through 11, they're one whole section. Um, and in chapter 10, we, we saw that Daniel, he, he's in uh, Persia. He's an old man, mid-80s. And he's been praying, he's been fasting, um, because there, there's some sort of issue going on in his life. Uh, it says specifically that he's mourning. And so he's fasting, praying, and he hasn't heard anything. Three weeks of not hearing an answer to uh, his prayers and fasting. But then God does show up, show up, uh, and we see that there's this spiritual battle that's happening around us. And then in chapter 11, we, we get to what the answer is. We get to the vision for Daniel. And what we see is, is that history is, is just on display for Daniel. From the time of Persia all the way to this individual named Antiochus Epiphanes, God is showing Daniel through this angel detail after detail about what is about to happen. Evil is going to be reigning in this world. The people of God are, are going to be suffering. There's going to be pain. And there will be a temptation for God's people in the midst of the evil, in the midst of pain. There's going to be this temptation to be seduced by the world. By the world. And so the, the hope for God's people in light of that vision and the hope for us in, in, in the midst of our evil world and and, and the pain that can happen around us is to stand firm in your faith because of our sovereign God. God knew everything that was going to happen. He showed that he uh, was ruling over everything. He was the one that's causing nations to come and go. And because of that, you can stand firm in your faith. That was true then. That was true now. And and today, we're actually going to be switching to the end times. Um, And and through that, we're going to get to see a a great motivation that should lead us to continue standing firm in our faith. And so, uh, I'll pray for our time, um, and then we'll read starting in verse 36. Father, I I pray for this time. Uh, I pray that you open our hearts and our minds to your word. Um, I pray that we seek you in, in all of this. Like the world is confusing, it's chaotic. Uh, you've given us a, a mission in, in all of that. You've given us commands and, and promises in, 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 myth, in the midst of a crazy world. And I pray that, that we see who you are uh, 2,000 years ago, but also that we see who you are today um, and who you will be and who we will be uh, in the future. And so uh, lead us, guide us, um, and transform us. Have there be worship this morning. And it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> so let's read verses 36 through the first half of verse 1 of chapter 12. It says, And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, 
For what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. He shall honor the god of, of fortresses instead of these. A god whom his fathers did not know he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. Those who acknowledge him he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall come into the countries and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land, and tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and of silver, and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with a great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. And he shall pitch his palatial tent between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end with none help him. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as has never been seen since there was a nation till that time. <laughs> okay. No, it's fine. So, uh, so we're continuing on again. So let me, let me just give you this framework real quick. We're going to be looking at this passage today in context of everything else that we've, we've looked at. Because this is one whole section, so we, we can't just forget what we've talked about. And <clears throat> what we saw in verse 36 through 45 is a continuation of what we talked about last week. What we, we talked about last week was that nations will come, nations will go, but evil will reign. Evil will rule. Because think about it. Look, look at 36 through 45. Uh, this isn't really the picture of, of godliness, is it? We, we see someone that speaks against God. There's idolatry. And there's even war, war that's going on. And so, so evil uh, is going on in the world. It's ruling. It, it's all over the place. But then look at, at verse 1 of chapter 12. Michael, he's on the, the angel. He's on the scene. There's this great prince, uh, the angel, this angel who uh, is on behalf of God's people, and he's warring. And he says, "And there will be a time of trouble such as there have never been." And so, as evil is in the world for God's people, persecution will be severe. Now, that's not mind-blowing to us because if we've been reading the Bible, uh, Jesus not only says that it will happen, it's a promise that it will happen. Uh, in John 15, 20, it says, the servant is not greater than his master. This is Jesus speaking. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And since the time of Jesus, since the time of and Tychus Epiphanes, God's people have been persecuted in different ways. And not only that, it's happening all over the world right now, right? And it will happen for years to come. Now the question is, in, in verse 36 through 45, who is this? Um, and there's a lot of debate as to who this could be. Uh, some think that this could be Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, again, when we, when we were looking at it last week, uh, the last half of our time in, in these verses, it, it was very clearly seen that Antiochus Epiphanes was prophesied being, coming in and persecuting the, the Jews at the time. And to some extent, he does fit some of the, the qualifications of this individual in verses 36 through 45. <clears throat> For example, in verse 37, it says that this person will magnify himself. 
uh, Antiochus. He's like the fourth or fifth one. Um, and he goes by Epiphanes, which means God manifested. Not only that, in verse 37, it says that he will abandon the gods of his fathers, which Antiochus did do. He abandoned Apollos, Adonis, and Dionysus. And so he does fit to some degree this character that, that's being spoken of in verses 36 through 45. But he still falls short of some of those qualifications. For example, um, even though he abandoned the gods of his father, he still worshipped Zeus. That's not a foreign god. That has connection to the Greek gods. Not only that, but in verse 45, it, it says that he, he's going to go against Egypt and he's going to die between the sea and the holy mountain, talking about Jerusalem. Historically, we know that Antiochus died in a minor campaign against um, Persia and not in this location at all. And we can even look at in verse 29 when it's talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, it says, at the time appointed... He shall return, talking about Antiochus. But in verse 40, it says, at the time of the end. And so the, the author, he, he's pointing out that these, this is happening at two different moments in history. Antiochus is happening at one, and then this character in 36 through 45 is happening at the end times. And now, of course, you can go, well, this is prophetic. Uh, maybe it's just not as precise as we would hope it would be. But again, we just, got, we just got done looking at the first half of 11, where time and time again, it was incredibly precise. It was detailed. And so, this could be Antiochus Epiphany, but it could be a different individual as well. It could be a specific individual, and that's where we get this idea of the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians or the man of lawlessness, a specific individual. Or it could be a type of individual, Antichrist, um, someone that is anti-God, anti-Jesus, someone that is anti-God's people. Now, you, you can kind of wrestle with that yourself. Uh, it doesn't impact the, the point of this passage and it shouldn't cause our fellowship to be broken or anything like that. But all throughout history, again, God's people have been suffering for the, for the gospel. People, God's people have been suffering and seeking to worship and follow God. Like think of uh, first century, uh, in the first century A.D., Christians, uh, rather, let's start with Nero. Nero, he has a party, burns half of Rome down, and he blames it on Christians. And the Christians are persecuted for, for a time. They could probably look at this passage right here and say, this is Nero. Life is hard, there's war going on, evil is ruling. Think in other places currently, maybe in North Korea. Probably not the best place to be a Christian right now. You see, the, the idea of chapter 11 is that evil will rule and God's people will suffer. And how does God want, want uh, his people to respond in the midst of evil, in the midst of suffering? Well, again, we look at it all, all together. So the application of last week is the application of this week. So verse 32. Speaking of Antiochus Epiphany, he will seduce and flatter those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. So, that, so to continue standing firm in your faith, You know, we, we, Jake just talked about going o overseas. We just talked about going and sharing the gospel uh, with Easter coming up. Is doing those things, are, 
is doing those things, is it difficult? Is it scary? Yes. Yes. Stanford. Is killing sin difficult? Is it costly? Yes. Stand firm. And is it easy to get distracted and seduced by the world and its riches? Yes. Stand firm. We have a sovereign God who is telling us that those struggles are, are not only going to happen, but they're promised. And at the end of the lot, at the end of your life, are you going to be able to look back and say, I stood firm or I was swayed? Now, we started off the, the conversation this morning with uh, motivations for faithfulness. Um, this might not be the most motivating thing right now, like, oh, the world's evil, it's going to be really difficult. Stand firm, like, show up hands, who's, who's motivated right now? Um, but again, last week we talked about God's character. That's still true. He's still sovereign. He still knows what's going to happen. He's still ruling from his throne. He sees you in your suffering. And in verses 1 through 4, Daniel gives us one more motivation to stand firm. So let's reread verse 1. <clears throat> So at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been seen since there was a nation until that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awaken, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who turn many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. <clears throat> so just a, a couple of things to, to point out. So there's this great trouble, this great tribulation, this tr great persecution against God's people. And it says in verse 1, the faithful will be delivered according to uh, the book of life, to, to their names being written in the book. Not only that, but it also talks about uh, those who are wise sh uh, shall shine. It's a tongue twister. Um, so, we, so we've seen people be talked about as wise before in chapter 11. Those being God's people. And so... What we're seeing here is that there's this, these, this two outcome uh, at the end of time. People will awaken from death to either everlasting contempt and shame or everlasting life. Those who are want, those who are wise sh shall shine. Those who know God and resulting in faithfulness. Those who know God, God resulting in faithfulness in the face of missing out on the pleasures of this world. In the face of the fear of evil in this world. In the face of even literally dying. Will receive everlasting life at the resurrection. Resurrection is guaranteed. For those who have put their faith in Christ, who is the firstborn from the dead, we too will rise with Him, right? 1 John 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. Do not miss out on what happens after this life. You know, we're, we're, we're such momentary creatures. Like, <clears throat> you know, we break our backs for, for things that, that don't last. Right? You know, technology, for example. We, we all want the coolest gadgets. 
those, those only last for like a year before there's something new and better. We break our backs for our families, for things that don't, that don't even last. If you have a kid and they, and they want something, you know how, how this goes. They want uh, to, to play a sport. They want the newest toy. And then afterwards, they, it's like they don't want it anymore, right? We, we break our back for comfort. Your reward is an eternal reward and is more valuable than anything else that this world can offer. And so the application is the same, but the motivation is look at your reward and stand firm in your faith. Like, like think about it. Um, all over Scripture, faithfulness is tied to this promised resurrection. I think Abraham, uh, Abraham's a very interesting story. Uh, if you remember, uh, he, God told him to go and sacrifice his kid, right? He goes, uh, the kid's like, where's the, where's the goat? Um, he's like, well, God will provide. And so he's, he's about to kill Isaac, and then he stopped. And a ram uh, is take, it takes Isaac's place. And that's a sign of faithfulness from Abraham. But hear what, what Hebrews 11 says. <clears throat> By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. Of him, it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And so according to Hebrews, why does Abraham go through with it? It says, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. Now, Hebrew, the author goes on with saying that happened figuratively, where Isaac wasn't uh, you know, given, given up. But Abraham was still looking to, the, to God being able to raise people from the dead. Many of us, where we're, we've been reading 2 Corinthians, um, and in chapter 1, Paul's talking about his afflictions his afflictions and, and his co co-workers and, and going and sharing the gospel, all the pain and suffering that they went through. And he says it in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the afflictions we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. In, indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And continues on in, in the book of 2 Corinthians about our hope in the resurrection. See, there's this feeling that we have about we might be missing out on something in this world. Those are, those are real, those are true feelings. But have, it, have it an eternal mindset. Even, even in persecution, in the face of persecution, the resurrection is a, is a guarantee. Justice will happen for persecutors. And you will still be resurrected with your king. We have a great, great, great motivation to stand for. We have a great hope in a sovereign God and a great hope in eternal life. Even if the world seduces us, or if the world kills us, and that reality should affect how we live. If you're struggling with faithfulness, sharing the gospel, killing sin, not getting sucked into the cares and idols of this world, you have to ask yourself: Do you believe these two things? Do you really believe that God is sovereign? That he's ruling, that he's in control, that he's over everything, even over death. Do you really believe you will be resurrected? Don't lose sight of those two things. God's word has been proven true all throughout the Bible, but especially in the book of Daniel. We saw that very clearly last week. And you can bet your life on those two facts. 
Now, we could, we could end there. That's a, a great place to, to stop, but we still have a few more verses. And so <clears throat> let's go ahead and read this last part real quick. It says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on the bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard them... Uh, and I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand towards heaven and swore by him who is forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest and, stand, and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. So Daniel sees these figures. One of them is very similar to a figure that we saw in chapter 7. And a question is asked that probably many of us have asked uh, in regards to the end times before. How long shall it be until these take place? When's the end times coming? And, and the answer comes in three different forms. In verse 7, it said, for a time, times, and half a time. And then in verse 11 and 12, we, we get these very specific number of days. We get 1,290 and 1,335. And so what could this mean? I don't have the answer. Um, in fact, Jesus says that he doesn't even know or angels even know. In Matthew 23, 36, it says, But concerning the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. But notice that the days are, are specific. The end will definitely come. Everything that, that we talked about just now, it will happen. And, and you know, people have guessed over, over and over when the world is going to end. Luther thought it was probably going to be in the 1600s. Uh, many of us, we remember it was supposed to end in 2012. Some think that the world will end this year and some will think that it will end 30 years from now. But the reality is, from the time of Jesus, we are 2,000 years closer to the end. And what does the angel say to Daniel in verse 13 in light of all of this, in, in light of the end coming? He says, go your way till the end. You know, we think about, well, I'll, I'll start being faithful next week. I'll start being faithful uh, when I've learned a few more things. Now is the right time to stand firm in your faith. Not after you've learned more. Christ could come back sooner. Not after your kids leave your house. They need to come before that happens. But now is the time to not be seduced by the world. Now is the time to not lose sight of your mission. Now is the time to kill sin and obey your God. And now is the time to remember who your sovereign God is and your future re resurrection. Start now. There, there are aspects of this book and, and this chapter that, that we can relate to. In verse 8, uh, Daniel says, but I don't understand. We can probably relate to a lot of, to, to that feeling right now. But let us make the plain things the main things. God is ruling and will rule complete. He's a, he's a great God. That's a great news because we're in a dark world that's getting dark. He is on his throne and his kingdom will one day take over this land. And when that time, time comes, again, 
Will you be able to look back at your life and say, I stood firm in faith, looking forward to that day, or I got swayed by this world? We have a great God and a great reward. Let us look to those two things and live God-honoring life.